year of ministry, I took a class on leading an adult catechumenate. Now, catechumenate is just a fancy way of saying new Christians, like converts. And the idea was to create this like six to 12 month program for folks who are new to Lutheranism and new to the congregation. And the presenter had this amazing vision and his excitement was palatable, but I had a problem. I had no catechumens. In fact, I had no new folks at all. I was pastoring a congregation whose average worship attendance was maybe 25 on a good Sunday in a town whose population had peaked 10 years earlier at 250, not 250,000, 250 people, two streets, no stoplights, you get the picture. So I asked the presenter, what then? Where do you start if this is your reality? And his response was kind of a gut punch, to be honest. He said, well, when was the last time you prayed for new folks to come to your congregation? And beloved, I want you to know that I really am a praying person. I pray for our congregation and its ministries. I pray for all of you all of the time. But I was quite humbled by his question because not only had I not been praying that the congregation might welcome new people, but the thought had never even occurred to me. <laughs> and so naturally, I took him up on this idea and I prayed and I prayed. I prayed in my personal devotions and in the intercessory prayers that I wrote each Sunday. And then nothing happened. <laughs> It is hard to grow a congregation in a community whose population and opportunities are shrinking. But I think his point is still sound. This prayer is one that our congregation might be prepared to welcome those that we don't even know to expect. That we might be part of God's boundary-breaking love and work with God to remove the obstacles that might prevent others from knowing fully the grace of God and living God's abundant life. Today's reading from Acts, it's once again part of this much longer story. So let's recap, right? Over here is the centurion Cornelius, a Roman officer who believed in God. And in a vision, he's told to send for somebody he's never met named Peter. And over here is Peter, who we do know, and Peter has a vision, uh, a pretty wild one, pun intended, and he is repeatedly shown all kinds of unclean animals and told to pig out, pun intended. <laughs> so Peter is shown all kinds of animals that he normally wouldn't touch, let alone eat. And when he declines what is offered, a voice tells him to not call what is unclean that which God has made clean. Now, it takes a few tries to get it through Peter's rock-hard skull, unlike, <laughs> pun intended, okay, good. <laughs> unlike Cornelius, who got it on the first go. But just as Peter wakes up from his third and final vision, Cornelius' people knock on the door, and Peter goes with them to Cornelius' home. And there he tells them all about Jesus. But even as he's just like, he's just like getting going, right? And even as this happens, it is clear that their conversion has already begun, that it had begun long before Peter arrived. But these are Romans. They're Gentiles. And so Peter asks, can anyone come up with a reason to prevent them from being baptized? And I suppose, if we were honest, we could be like, there's actually a third vision, y'all, and where somebody pipes up and says, well, in the future, the church is going to make parents of infants read a statement that says they believe in crazy things like a virgin birth and the resurrection of the dead, and something about the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, which really just stumps some people called Lutherans. <laughs> but these folks haven't confessed that, so I don't think we should let them in. Thankfully, there is no vision like that. 
You know, interestingly, in last week's reading, there's a whole verse that got added about a century later that says that the Ethiopian is, eunuch is actually first asked to profess being baptized. The church was really unsure about this. But, but in Acts, profession is not the primary obstacle to faith or to baptism. It isn't about saying what you believe. What most often prevents people from baptism then and now is that they're not here. That nobody got a personalized vision about them. That they're not sought out, especially if they don't speak our language, if they don't hear or see well, if they cannot get to worship unless we give them a ride. They can't serve on a committee or a task force if they require more of the church than we expected to give, or if they call our carefully held values into question. We withhold the waters of baptism most often by negligence, because no one sets a place at the table in order that its emptiness might become a longing ache in the community. Over the last year or so, a small group of us has been considering St. Thomas's welcome to folks with disabilities. We've been working with Stone Bell Ark and their chaplain, Reverend Sarah McKinney. And one of the tools that she provided for us is the belonging wheel, which you can see on the back inside cover of your bulletin this morning. At their heart, these 10 dimensions of belonging recognize the many boundaries that prevent people from experiencing the love of God within the beloved community. But they are also a vision for us, an invitation to unhinder the word of God and to proclaim God's boundary-breaking love in word and action. Can anyone withhold the waters of baptism? This is actually the pivotal question of the book of Acts. It's essentially the question we heard last week when the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip stopped at, I, I don't know, a desert oasis, a giant mud puddle, whatever it is. The Ethiopian eunuch says, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptism? Prevent, hinder, these are all the same word. And, in fact, this word comes up again and again and again and acts always in the negative, always asking, what should hinder this? What should prevent this? It is even the root of the very last word of this book, that the word of God continues to be proclaimed boldly and without hindrance. That's the vision. Given our skill at hindering one another, it should really surprise us how much Luke emphasizes the unhindered word, of, uh, word and grace of God, the unprevented spirit that blows wherever she will. Instead of borders and boundaries, the book of Acts is God's call that we mirror the spirit's work in the world. And so be those who prepare a place, invite others, Host and welcome new folks. Know and accept one another. Support, care for, and befriend each other. Need one another. And love. Love one another, beloved. Acts is this endless invitation to relinquish our gatekeeping in order to stand in awe at just what the Spirit can do. Amen.